Good evening, everyone. If you would please take your seats. Uh, welcome to tonight's talk. My name is Jack Ryan. I'm the Vice Provost and the Dean of Arts and Humanities here at Gettysburg College. I'm going to go through a couple very small housekeeping pieces, and then I'm going to turn everything over for introductions. Um, what I'd like to start with is a brief portion of the Gettysburg College mission. The college believes in the power of a liberal arts education to help students develop critical thinking skills, broad vision, and effective communication. We further believe in the free and open exchange of ideas, the worth and dignity of all peoples, and the limitless value of their intellectual potential, civil discourse, and a strong commitment to a diverse and inclusive learning environment. It is in this spirit that we have allowed Young Americans for Freedom to invite Robert Spencer to our campus this evening. These are some expectations I'd like you to abide by during tonight's talk. We have one clear and very basic expectation for this evening's event, and that is an expectation that we will all engage in civil discourse and conduct. Disrupting the speaker or any attempt to shout him down is not something that will be tolerated. Any conduct that jeopardizes the safety of our audience or violates college policy or law will additionally not be tolerated. We're fortunate to have our public safety officers here tonight, joined by our partners from the Pennsylvania State Police and the Gettysburg Police. These officers will help ensure the safety of our venue and the safety of everyone in attendance tonight. Uh, at the end of Mr. Spencer's remarks, there will be time for questions and answers. Um, we will moderate the question and answers, so if you formulate those questions in advance, that would be very helpful. And now I would like to invite to the stage Scott Moore, who is the president of Gettysburg College's chapter of Young Americans for Freedom. Scott? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm current president of the Gettysburg College's chapter of Young Americans for Freedom. Um, on behalf of our club, I'd like to thank you all for choosing to come to our event tonight. Um, the title of this event is the political ramifications of Islamic fundamentalism. Um, YAF began the year with a commemoration of the 15th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. We have chosen to end it by bringing attention to the thousands of innocent people who have died all over the world in the intervening months. Um, our 9-11 event expressed our continued warning for those lost, but this event, um, we brought Robert Spencer here so that he could discuss what we could do in the future, and so that the school could show its support for free inquiry and um, academic ideals. We are very pleased that the college has upheld its commitment to intellectualism by allowing us to bring Mr. Spencer here um, so we can honestly and openly address the root causes of Islamic fundamentalism and the implications they will have for us in the coming years. Uh, as some of the responses to the event have shown, the, there are not, um, there's not complete agreement among the advisor, administrators, faculty, and students of the college over whether or not these issues should be discussed as they are controversial and um, have caused issues in the past. Uh, accusations of Islamophobia have been directed at our members along with tonight's speaker in justifying for the calls for this event to be canceled. Islamophobia is a baseless insult. A phobia is clearly defined as an irrational fear. It is never irrational to criticize an ideology or a belief, and the fact that we are hosting this event and that Robert Spencer has been publicly critiquing aspects of Islamic theology for decades is proof that we are not afraid. 
Mr. Spencer himself is an accomplished New York Times bestselling author who has been studying Islam for decades and is the founder and director of Jihad Watch. He has led seminars on Islam and terrorism for the FBI, the United States Central Command, the United States Army, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and the Justice Department's Anti-Terrorism <coughs> Advisory Council. The claims that Mr. Spencer is unqualified to speak on these issues are obviously baseless and are lies being spread by those who hope to suppress any free inquiry into the issues of radicalism. On behalf of every member of the Gettysburg College community who appreciates intellectual diversity, we would like to extend our gratitude to him for choosing to spend his evening with us and for the outstanding courage he has displayed throughout his long career. I also thank the Young America's Foundation for allowing this event to happen and being so supportive, and Gettysburg College for um, all the administrators, faculty, and students who, while they might disagree with the content of this lecture, were very supportive of our ability and right to express ourselves. <laughs> Lastly, I have to thank the wonderful and committed members of Young Americans for Freedom at Gettysburg College, who have been wonderful in supporting this event and allowing all of this to happen. And um, with that, I would like to introduce Robert Spencer. Thank you, friends. So very kind of you to come to this. This is an age in which colleges and universities all over the nation place, place a tremendous premium on diversity. And that is wonderful, but there is one kind of diversity that is not valued generally in an academic setting, and that is intellectual diversity. There is very little tolerance given for opinions that dissent from the establishment line. And so I commend you, in the first place, for having the courage to brave the stigma and to come here tonight despite the tremendous pressure that was placed upon you not to come, notably by the president of the university of the college herself, you would think that a university or a college should be a setting that prizes free inquiry and expression and the free exchange of ideas. It would seem to me that any administrator who does not place a premium on such principles and rather stigmatizes the one point of view without examination is unworthy to serve in an administrative role and should immediately resign. In any case, I thank you for being here. Many of you, of course, are here for the sideshow and to uh, look, to gawk at the hate monger. And I'm terribly sorry to disappoint you, but what we have in this situation is actually a very determined effort to make it so that the point of view that I represent is not examined. Mr. Professor Green, who was here Sunday, is a key exponent of that effort. He is by no means the only one. And the way that it goes is briefly this. The concept of Islamophobia, which is a recent coinage by the International Institute of Islamic Thought, a Muslim Brotherhood Saudi financing organization. The concept of Islamophobia was invented and is used in a deliberately misleading and confusing way to refer to two quite disparate things. One of them is vigilante attacks on innocent people. Those, of course, are never justified, never justifiable, never acceptable under any circumstances. And if that is what is meant by Islamophobia, then every decent human being should be against it. At the same time, there is a deliberate conflation of that Islamophobia with any honest analysis of the way in which Islamic jihadis use the texts and teachings of Islam to justify hatred, violence, oppression, and supremacism. And that too is called Islamophobia. And that is why many of you here are certain that you have come to see a vicious gargoyle. But what we have is, in this concerted effort to stigmatize, demonize, marginalize, and silence this perspective, the ultimate goal is to silence any criticism of the advancing jihad terror imperative and the motivating ideology that guides it and gives it impetus. And if that effort is effective, then everyone will be afraid to speak out against 
jihad terror activity because they will be afraid of the stigma of Islamophobia, racism, bigotry, and what have you. For example, in December, December 2nd, 2015, there were two Muslims who were allied with ISIS, the Islamic State, Syed Rizwan Farouk and Tashfeen Malik, and they went to a Christmas party in San Bernardino, California, and murdered 15 people in cold blood. After that happened, their neighbors were interviewed. Of course, you can imagine that the international media was all over the area. And some of the neighbors said, yes, we saw suspicious activity at that house. We saw strange comings and goings all night. And very, very suspicious looking characters. And then they were asked the inevitable question, well, did you call the cops? No, they said, we didn't want to be engaging in racial profiling. They were afraid of being stigmatized as Islamophobic. This kind of thing has happened many, many times, unfortunately. One other notable example was Major Nidal Malik Hassan. Major Nidal Malik Hassan, in November 2009, he was an army psychiatrist at Fort Hood in Texas. And while screaming, Allah Akbar, Allah is greater, which is a uh, cry that's inexplicably, inextricably rooted to Islam, he gunned down 13 people at Fort Hood. And Nidal Malik Hassan had actually given some indication that this was something he was going to do before he did it. He gave a lecture to his colleagues, other army psychiatrists. It was supposed to be about psychiatry. But instead, he made it all about Islam and Jihad. And he explained that according to the Quran, that Muslims had a responsibility to wage war against unbelievers in Islam and subjugate them under the rule of Islamic law. He quoted many passages of the Quran, the Islamic holy book, including notably chapter 9, verse 29, which goes like this, fight against those who do not believe in Allah in the last day, and do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book, which is the Quran's term primarily for Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya, which is a tax, with willing submission, and feel themselves subdued. Nidal Malik Hassan took that verse, various other passages, uh, exhorting Muslims to wage war against unbelievers. For if you want to keep track and check up on me, it's chapter 2, verse 191, chapter 4, verse 89, chapter 9, verse 5, chapter 47, verse 4, various others. Anyway, he took those and he explained them to the army psychiatrists. And then he said that what could happen was a lot like what happened with Sergeant Hassan Akbar. Sergeant Hassan Akbar was an American soldier. He, his birth name was Mark Cools, Mark Fidel Cools, as a matter of fact. Fidel was his middle name. And he converted to Islam and changed his name to Hassan Akbar. He joined the U.S. Army, and he was in Kuwait in 2003. He lobbed a grenade into a tent full of American military personnel and killed several of them. And he explained that it was forbidden, and it's true, according to chapter 4, verse 92 of the Quran, a Muslim is forbidden to kill another Muslim. It was forbidden to him as a Muslim to be waging war in Iraq and killing other Muslims. So he killed the American commanding officers of his own unit instead. Now, Nidal Hassan at Fort Hood referred to Hassan Akbar in this lecture to the psychiatrists, and he warned that that kind of thing could happen again with Muslims in the military if they were made to fight against fellow Muslims. So in other words, he was threatening, he was warning of violent mass murder attack. And so people were alarmed. I mean, who wouldn't be? And so they went to his superiors in the military and they said, you know, we're worried about Hassan that he might end up waging jihad himself at some point. Not only that, but Hassan was in contact with Anwar al-Laki. Anwar al-Laki was an imam from, he was actually born in New Mexico. He became a jihad terror leader. He was uh, in touch with some of the 9-11 hijackers. He was in touch with uh, uh, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttallab, who was a uh, Muslim who tried to set his underwear on fire in a plane in Detroit, over Detroit. On Christmas Day 2008, he uh, hoped to blow up the plane, but unfortunately, 
he only caused a little bit of harm to himself. In any case, he was in touch with him, he was in touch with other jihad terrorists as well. And Nidal Hassan is emailing back and forth with Anwar al -Laki. There was an FBI agent who discovered this communication and sent it to his superiors. And his superiors said, this is not something we're interested in. And it happened again. And he did it again. And his superiors said, this is not something we're interested in. Top FBI people, just not interested that we have an army major who is communicating with an international terrorist leader. Not, we don't care. And what they did was, instead of disciplining Major Hassan, instead of investigating him, instead of doing anything at all, they promoted him. And it is very clear that they did this because of the fear of charges of Islamophobia. That they knew what would happen if they did anything else with Major Hassan, they knew that if they looked into what he was doing and tried to stop him, that there would be a CNN report, Islamophobia in the military, pious Muslims stopped from discussing Islam with his colleagues when the men had made threats of murder. And they knew that the stigma of Islamophobia would be so great it would be a career killer, their careers in the military would be ruined, they did nothing, 13 people were killed. This is what charges of Islamophobia do. Islamophobia is essentially, as Abdurrahman Muhammad actually acknowledged, Abdurrahman Muhammad was a member of the International Institute of Islamic Law in the 90s. And later he grew disenchanted with the group and he spilled the beans on some of their activities. And he explained that Islam, he was at the meeting where Islamophobia was invented in the 90s and that it was a tool, he called it a thought-crushing device a tool to intimidate people into being afraid to speak out about jihad terror activity. And it, it worked beautifully. Everybody was here Sunday and very happy to hear Professor Green, and Professor Green indulged in quite a bit of character assassination and slander against me, but this is how it works. The idea is to make everybody who speaks about the nature and magnitude of the jihad threat, honestly, so toxic that other people are afraid to speak out themselves, and then nobody's speaking out. And that's how it proceeds. That's what Professor Green is all about. This is why it's really sort of a, a, absolutely opposed to the idea of a university itself, to have somebody come in and say, you shouldn't listen to somebody else. If you've ever studied logic, you know that the argument from authority is the weakest of all arguments. What does that mean? If you say, you should believe me because that guy is a bad person. Well, how do I know that the speaker is not a worse person? How do I know that the speaker knows anything about what he's talking about? You should not listen to this fellow because he's wicked and evil. Well, how do I know if I don't listen to him myself? You are, if you agree, if you go along with that kind of thinking, then you are placing yourself under the authority of those who say those things. And they might not be worthy of that trust. And this is why free inquiry and free expression are absolutely foundational, to, especially to the idea of a university where you should have the freedom to consider all ideas on their merits and discuss them on a rational basis. And speaking of rational basis, I have invited Professor Green to debate me, and he has always refused. So that's very interesting. He doesn't want to talk, and I'm willing to. Now, there was a very helpful article in the, uh, I believe it was in the Gettysburgian, is that right? Uh, a very helpful, very well-written article, I commend the author, uh, about Professor Green's lecture. And so even though I was unable to be there, I would certainly have been there if I had been able, but I was uh, being yelled at at another university. And <laughs> the article, however, was very helpful in explaining some of the things that he said. One of the things that he said was he quoted me saying, traditional Islam is not modern or peaceful. And he said this was a terrible thing to say. And in response, he adduced an FBI survey that purported to show that 94% of terror attacks worldwide are committed by non-Muslims. Now, let's go back to logic again. If traditional Islam is X or Y, we won't even say what it is or isn't, but just traditional Islam is one thing or another. And then Professor Green says, 
no, that's wrong because most terror attacks are committed by non-Muslims. He's actually, that's a non-sequitur. A non-sequitur means it does not follow. That has nothing to do with whether traditional Islam is peaceful or not, or what traditional Islam is or isn't. There is no necessary connection between what traditional Islam is or isn't, and how many people commit, how many people of what kind commit various terror attacks. So he's committing basic fallacies of logic that anybody should be able to notice, but that is a revelation of the fact that his intent is essentially and inherently propagandistic. Now, as for that FBI survey, 94% of terror attacks are committed by non-Muslims. That was an extraordinary survey. And one reason why it was an extraordinary survey is that it treated every terror attack as the same thing. Each one had equal value. So, in other words, if PETA took red paint and threw it on a woman wearing fur, that was one terror attack. And if Islamic jihadis killed 3,000 people on 9-11, that was one terror attack. That was how they came to the conclusion that 94% of terror attacks were committed by non-Muslims. So I would suggest to you that there again we have some very fallacious reasons. And that what we really need to be doing is going about this a bit more rationally. If we want to discuss what traditional Islam is or isn't, then let's look at traditional Islam. What a novel concept. I brought it with me. I happen to have here the Quran, the holy book of Islam, and I have here a manual of Sharia, Islamic sacred law. Now, you can say, well, okay, you brought these books, but they're just probably more of your Islamophobic hate literature. Okay. Do you remember on June 4th, 2009, Barack Obama went to Cairo and he spoke and he gave a speech of outreach to the Islamic world. It was widely hailed, and it was internationally publicized, of course, and it was considered to be the herald of a new good relationship between the United States and Muslim countries. Didn't quite work out that way. But in any case, the reason why I bring it up is that he spoke at Al-Azhar. Al-Azhar in Cairo is an institution of Islamic learning that is well over a thousand years old. As a matter of fact, Obama praised it as a beacon of light, a beacon of learning for over a thousand years. And no doubt that is exactly what it is. It is the most prestigious and influential institution in Sunni Islam, and Sunni Muslims are 85 to 90 percent of Muslims worldwide. So, as it happens, this book that I have with me, it, says, it carries with it an endorsement from Al-Azhar. And the endorsement from Al-Azhar says this, that we certify that the above-mentioned translation, that is the one I've got right here, the above-mentioned translation corresponds to the Arabic original and conforms to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community. Conforms to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community. So the most prestigious and influential institution in Sunni Islam is saying this book will tell you what Sunni Islam is all about. Fair enough? So you don't have to believe the hate-filled hate Islamophobe. Let's go straight to traditional Islamic sources and the foremost institution in the largest sect of Islam. And that's what we have right here. So you don't have to listen to me. I will just read it. And you can check up on this too. This is section 09.0. Jihad means to war against non-Muslims. And it is etymologically derived from the word mujahada, signifying warfare to establish the religion. Did I write that? Did I make that up? Am I misrepresenting the twisted and hijacked Islam of Al-Qaeda and ISIS for the real thing that the vast majority of Muslims believe? No, this is Al-Azhar. This is an institution praised by Obama, praised by the New York Times as a beacon of Islamic moderation. And they're saying jihad is warfare against non-Muslims. And they say that the Muslim community makes war upon Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians, provided they first invited them to enter Islam in faith and practice. So you first invite them to accept Islam. Then you invite them to enter the social order of Islam by paying the non-Muslim poll tax. You may recall that a few minutes ago I quoted chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran, which said that non-Muslims must fight against the people of the book until they pay the jizya, the tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. 
And now here the law manual says that the warfare is in the first place you invite them to accept Islam, secondly you invite them to enter that Islamic social order and pay that tax, and else, and, or, and the war continues until they become Muslim or else pay the non-Muslim poll tax. And then it quotes chapter 9, verse 29. It also quotes in the same area, the same discussion of jihad, chapter 2, verse 216 of the Quran, fighting is prescribed for you. Chapter 4, verse 89, which I did mention before also, kill them wherever you find them. And chapter 9, verse 36, fight the idolaters utterly. There are also many others that they could have quoted, fight them until religion is all for Allah, chapter 8, verse 39, when you meet the unbelievers, strike the next, chapter 47, verse 4, and so on. And then it quotes Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, who uh, his statements that are considered authentic are considered normative for Islamic law. And he says, I've been commanded to fight people. I've been commanded to fight people, not give them a hug. I've been commanded to fight people until they testify that there is no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and perform the prayer and pay zakat, which is alms. That is, until they, that they convert to Islam and conform to the pillars of Islam, including paying zakat, the almsgiving, and salat, the prayer, and so on. If they say it, they say it that there's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. If they say it, they have saved their blood and possessions from me, which means their blood and possessions are not saved from him if they don't say it, except for the rights of Islam over them. Now, once the non-Muslims have been fought against and defeated, then they pay that tax and they enter into the Islamic social order. The Muslims are exempt from paying the tax and the non-Muslims also have to conform to various humiliating and discriminatory regulations which are also clearly delineated in Islamic law. The uh, non-Muslims are distinguished from Muslims in dress wearing a wide cloth belt, and this is so that the next stipulation can be made. They are not greeted with assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, because you greet a, if a Muslim is greeting a non-Muslim according to Islamic law, it should say, peace be upon those who are rightly guided. In other words, peace be upon the Muslims, not on the non-Muslims. Must keep to the side of the street, that is, you step off the sidewalk if a Muslim is coming in deference, like in the old Jim Crow South. May not build higher than or as high as the Muslims' buildings. And so, in other words, the non-Muslim buildings have to be lower than the Muslims. It's a sign of supremacy. They are forbidden to openly display wine or pork, to ring church bells or display crosses, recite the Torah or gospel aloud, or make public display of their funerals and feast days, and are forbidden to build new churches, so the communities are always in a state of decline. Now, here again, this is all Islamic law that is considered to be the immutable and perfect law of Allah. It is derived from the Quran and the statements of Muhammad, as is clear from the quotations I gave you. I didn't make it up. It is not the province of some crazy sect off in the corner, but is the doctrine of one of the principal institutions in Sunni Islam. Now, does this of course mean that every Muslim is a terrorist? And no, of course, Contrary to the slanders that have been going around, I've never said such a thing. The reality is, of course, in Islam, as in every religious tradition, there is a spectrum of belief, knowledge, and fervor among its adherents. And so you know people who are Christians, I'm sure, and you know some who are very, very knowledgeable and very vocal about it, and then you know some people who say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, while they are not really paying any attention to it at all, and you probably know a lot of people in between those two. And it's the same thing in Islam. There are people who are very devout and knowledgeable, people who are knowledgeable and not devout, people who are devout and not knowledgeable, and every grade in between the spectrum. So you can't generalize from the teachings of Islam what any individual Muslim is going to do, or even assume that any individual Muslim holds to those things any more than you can assume that any Christian is going to love his enemies and turn the other cheek. But these things do not nonetheless become not part of the Islamic tradition for all that. Now, the reason why this matters is jihadis point to this material all the time to justify what they're doing and to make recruits among peaceful Muslims. This is exactly how they make recruits, as a matter of fact. They do indeed retail a great deal of grievances in regard to uh, alleged atrocities by the United States or Israel or other non-Muslim actors. And that is also based on an Islamic theological principle, as a matter of fact. 
because in Islamic theology, only the caliph has the authorization to wage offensive jihad. That is, as I quoted from chapter 8, verse 39 of the Quran, fight them until religion is all for Allah. Only the caliph in Islamic law, the leader of all the Muslim community, is authorized to declare that and to make it happen. He has the responsibility to do that, but only he has the authority to do that. Now, the problem in the Islamic world since 1924 is that there's no caliph, unless you're a member of ISIS and you believe that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is the caliph, but most Muslims don't. So, there's in the absence of a caliph, no offensive jihad can be waged, only defensive jihad. Now, defensive jihad becomes the responsibility. Jihad is a communal obligation, fart kafaya, a communal obligation on the Muslims generally, that they uh, have the responsibility to wage jihad. But it is discharged if, 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 if my friends over here are doing it, then I don't have to. It's, it's a communal obligation, but not an individual obligation. However, if a Muslim land is attacked in Islamic theology, then it becomes an individual obligation of every Muslim, according to Islamic law, to wage jihad. And so you often find jihad leaders retailing lists of grievances and saying how terrible the Americans did this, the Americans did that, the Americans did something else, and so we have to wage jihad. And this is because they have to justify their jihad as defensive in order to, for it to be allowable under Islamic law at all. A lot of Western non-Muslims see those lists of grievances and think, oh, this is all just political. It's not really religious at all. It doesn't have anything to do with Islam. It has to do with political differences and grievances that if we adjusted our foreign policy would go away. Unfortunately, the jihad has existed longer than American foreign policy, longer than the United States of America. And it is clear from history that it was uh, by no means simply a defensive thing. In the days when there was a caliph, which was for most of Islamic history, particularly in the age of the Khalifa Rashidun, as they're known, the rightly guided caliphs, the four caliphs, the four leaders of the Muslim community after Muhammad, uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, uh, the uh, Muslims uh, conquered a huge expanse of territory in North Africa and the Middle East, Persia, and India. Now, those conquests were justified by the various texts and teachings that I'm discussing now. There was no American imperialism in those days. There was no Israel in those days. There was not even anybody bothering them. The, uh, uh, the first Arab armies, of course, came out of Arabia. Arabia was between the two great powers of the day, the Byzantine Empire, otherwise known as the Eastern Roman Empire, and the Persian Empire. And uh, the Byzantines and the Persians at the late part of the 6th century and the beginning of the 7th century, right before Islam comes on the scene, they fought a series of wars against each other. A series of very, very destructive wars, such that the two great powers of the world at the time of the advent of Islam were absolutely militarily exhausted. The last battle recorded in the Islamic traditions that Muhammad participated in is known as the Battle of Tabuk. Tabuk is a town in northern Arabia or southern Syria, depending on where you draw the boundary. And the story goes that Muhammad went up there in the year 631, and he meant to engage the Byzantine garrison in Tabuk in battle. But when he got there, there wasn't any Byzantine garrison. I mean, there was the place, but there were no troops. They were gone. And they were gone because the Byzantines in those days, they had a series of garrisons all across the border areas of North Africa and the Middle East, but they did not have enough troops to stop them after all their wars with Persia. So they were moving the garrisons, moving the troops from garrison to garrison, trying to make, just do what they could to make sure that nothing bad happened. In this context, it was very easy for the Arab armies to come out and conquer, but the point is they weren't answering any aggression. They were working from the principles delineated in the Quran and Hadith, and jihad terrorists are using them today. Now, Sun Tzu is the ancient strategist of war, and one of the foremost principles that he enunciated when you were dealing with people who want to destroy you is that you have to know them. You have to know the enemy. You have to understand the enemy. If you do not understand the enemy, then he will do things that will surprise you and you will not be able to defeat him. This is the situation that we're in. By demonizing 
and stigmatizing any discussion of how jihadis use the texts and teachings of Islam to justify violence, we are putting ourselves in the position of making it impossible for us to understand the motivating ideology that guides those who have vowed repeatedly to destroy us. That is foolhardy in the extreme, and ultimately suicidal. And you really got to wonder, what is a man like Professor Green about when he's made his whole life all about smearing and defaming those who speak the truth about these issues? Another thing that he said was that it was a terrible thing that Islamophobes like me, we say that there's something called civilization jihad, which is a Muslim Brotherhood effort to undermine the U.S. from within. Yeah, that sounds terrible, right? Stupid conspiracy theory. Wow, those racist, bigoted Islamophobes, my goodness, they ought to be shut up in prison. Well, as a matter of fact, what Professor Green did not tell you about was a captured internal document of the Muslim Brotherhood that was found during the Holy Land Foundation trials in 2007. The Holy Land Foundation was once the largest Islamic charity in the United States. It has now been shut down because it was funneling money to Hamas. Hamas is, of course, a terrorist group that celebrates the murders of Israeli civilians. They pass out candies when they kill little babies. Very, very uh, unpleasant group. You don't really want to have them over. And the, the Holy Land Foundation actually had on its website a picture of the burning Twin Towers, and it said, donate to the 9-11 victims. And if you donated through that click, that website, that portal, whatever it is, then you would be giving money to Hamas. So they were shut down because it's illegal under American law to give money to a terrorist group. Now, during the course of the investigation, agents went into the Holy Land Foundation's offices and they took out boxes of papers. Among the papers they found was an explanatory memorandum for the strategic goals of the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States, written by a top-level Muslim Brotherhood operative, Muhammad Akram. And it said, and I quote, that the brothers in America must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands, that is the hands of the Westerners, and of the believers, so that it falls and Allah's religion is victorious over other religions. Did you get that? Eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it falls and Allah's religion is victorious over other religions. Now, think about that in light of everything that I have been telling you about the imperatives in Islamic law and Islamic scripture for conquest and subjugation of the unbelievers. And if you are going to do it by subverting from within and sabotaging and making themselves do it, they, they do themselves in, eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands, if you're going to make the Westerners do it themselves, what better way than first you make everybody afraid to speak out about these issues. You make everybody think that those who do speak out about these issues are terrible, racist, bigoted hate mongers that no decent person should ever give a hearing to. And so then, the plan advances, and nobody's, nobody has the guts to speak out. And nobody has the guts to say what's happening, because everybody's afraid. This is what's being done. And it's marvelously successful, you know? Everywhere I go, every time I speak at college, it's either a lot of screaming fascists, and yes, fascists is an intentionally chosen word to say, no, 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 you're the fascist. They are uh, wonderful, tolerant leftists. Yes, well, in fact, in the 1930s, the brown shirts, the Nazi brown shirts, they were Nazi thugs, as in, 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 in short, they just wore uniforms, brown uniforms. They used to go to colleges, because the colleges in those days, there were a lot of people who would speak against Nazism. And they would shout them down. They would physically menace them so that a lot of them had to have a lot of guards around to be able to speak in any modicum of peace. And they would brutalize them and make sure that as few people heard them as possible. That is a quintessentially fascist act to control the discourse so that only one point of view is heard, 
and everybody is too intimidated to think that any other point of view is even acceptable to think about. And so, yes, what we have is a tremendous wave of fascism on American campuses today, and it's coming from the left. And it's coming from those who would foreclose upon any dissent, which is a quintessentially totalitarian, authoritarian act. The university, a college, ought to be a place where free inquiry is prized above all. And ideas are accepted or dismissed on their merits, not because somebody told you that the person who's holding them is a bad person. I would doubt that any of the people who are distributing the literature or agitating or calling upon this talk to be canceled have ever read a word of what I have said, of what I've written. And this is no surprise, really, because that's the whole idea, to make sure that none of these things get out. Now, of course, I'm the one speaking to you today. This isn't really personal. Anybody who speaks out about these issues is stigmatized in the same way. The Council on American Islamic Relations, which is a Hamas-linked Muslim Brotherhood organization in the United States, and those ties are established by the Justice Department. The Council on American Islamic Relations issued a, uh, uh, state, uh, uh, what do you call it, a report about uh, Islamophobia. It was very nicely published and handsome, uh, weird little drawing of me, I didn't think it looked very much like me, but um, all of us there, all the rogues gallery of all, our, our, uh, all, all my colleagues and me, and they said in the course of it that there is legitimate criticism of Islam and Jihad, and then there's Islamophobia. Now, you might think that, too. You might think that, yeah, well, we can have a discussion about jihad terrorism without engaging in this horrible bigotry. Okay, but one interesting thing about that was that the Council on American Islamic Relations did not, in that report, or anywhere else ever, name a single critic of Islam and jihad that it thought was not Islamophobic. Anybody who speaks out about how jihadis use the texts and teachings of Islam even if they, as I do, acknowledge that there are other interpretations and that not all Muslims hold this and all that, is stigmatized as Islamophobic. And you should understand what that is all about. Now, what kinds of things is it covering up? Let me give you just a few more before we uh, go to the Q&A. Uh, a few years back, you may have heard of uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria and they captured a lot of girls and they made them into sex slaves. And it was a terrible, lurid, disgusting story. And Michelle Obama was horrified and she held up a sign with a hashtag, bring back our girls. You remember that? And a few years later, ISIS did the same thing. They captured a bunch of Yazidi and Christian women and they made them into sex slaves. Now, unfortunately, this is something that also has justification in the Islamic texts. Chapter 4, verse 3 of the Quran, it says, if you fear, oh, marry the women that seem good to you, two or three or four, it's four wives allowed, if you fear that you will not be able to treat them justly, then only one, or from among those your right hands possess. Now, what is that? What is the one whom your right hands possess? We get a clue in 424, chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran, which is explaining to Muslim men uh, various women that they should not have sexual relations with. And it says, also forbidden to you are all married women, except those women whom your right hands possess. Okay, so now we know that you can have sex with women who your right hands possess. Where did they come from? That is in chapter 33, verse 50, where it says, O prophet, we have sent forth to you, oops, sorry, wrong place. Oh, prophet, we have made lawful for you your wives whose bridal dues you have paid and the slave girls you possess from among the prisoners of war. The slave girls you possess from among the prisoners of war. The slave girls you possess from among the prisoners of war are just like those Yazidi and Christian women and the girls in Nigeria who were captured during battles with non-Muslims by jihad groups. Now, this Quran that I brought, it's very helpful, it has commentary by Sayyid Abu Allah Maududi. Uh, any of you, you can ask your, uh, the Muslims who are boycotting, you can ask them about Maududi. He is a uh, Pakistani Islamic scholar 
He died in 1979. He was internationally famous, and uh, he was the founder of Jamaat e Islami, which is still the largest Islamist political party in Pakistan. He was also a scholar of Islam. He wrote a multi volume commentary on the Quran. And this is a handy one volume digest of it. I tell you about Maududi because he's very mainstream. I guarantee you that if you go into your local Islamic bookstore, they will have writings by Maududi. They'll probably have his commentary on the Quran. And I've never been in an Islamic bookstore, and I do go to them quite often, that doesn't have Maududi. Anyway, he says, captives who your right hands possess, he says, this expression denotes slave girls, i.e., female captives of war who are distributed by the state among individuals when no exchange of prisoners of war takes place. Now, this is a terrible human rights violation, uh, the destruction of the lives of innumerable numbers of girls and young women, and it is absolutely stigmatized to talk about the motives that give rise to it and the justifications that are given for it. When I try to uh, quote these verses, I thank you for being polite, when I tried to quote these verses the other day at the uh, University of Buffalo, I uh, was immediately overwhelmed with people screaming and yelling and booing. And I thought, you know that you're booing the Quran. And you're supposed to be not the Islamophobes, so you might want to rethink. But in any case, the problem in obscuring the motives and the justifications for this practice is that you're never going to eradicate this practice without addressing them. You're never going to stop this from happening until there is reform from Muslims of goodwill who say, no, this is something that must never happen now, and they would go into, not talk to non-Muslims about it, but go to the Muslims who believe this kind of thing is justified and tell them that this must not happen. And until that kind of thing takes place, these practices are going to continue. And as long as everyone who's calling attention to them is demonized, then they're going to continue all the more. Evil advances under the cover of darkness. When you shed light on it, that's when it stops. And so that is what I am doing, and that is why I am here. I thank you for listening. These are unpleasant facts, but they are realities. It is not hatred or bigotry to discuss the motives and goals of jihad terrorists. And the enterprise of calling it hatred and bigotry is an effort to make it impossible to impede the advance of the jihad terrorists. And so you are to be commended for standing up to that stigmatization and demonization. And I hope that you will continue to pursue the uh, defense of the freedom of thought and the freedom of speech, which is the foundation of any free society. If the tyrant can say, oh, that's hate speech, you can't hear that, that's illegal. You must not hear that. Then the tyrant can rule over you. He can stigmatize any one of his opponents as haters, and then they can't do anything about what he's being tyrannical about. If you are going to stop a tyrant and have a free society, then you have to have the freedom of speech and free inquiry. Any college administrator, any college president should know that. So I'm sorry that the president, is the president here? I don't think so, but uh, I uh, would ask her to, uh, in closing, to retract publicly or substantiate from my own writings the charges that she gave to me of bigotry and hatred and to uh, apologize for trying to impede free inquiry and to resign. Thank you very much. <laughs>